a lot of people think, oh, well, you can market it. It gives you more investors that you can put your deal in front of. And there's truth to that. But the key is you have to know how to market it. Because if you don't, it's going to be quite a learning experience. Welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab, where your host, Dave Lindahl, dissects recent multifamily deals done by his guests. Dave will extract what went right, what went wrong, and a number of key takeaways so your next deal may be more profitable. Welcome to this edition of Multifamily Deal Lab, where we dissect deals. And today I am with Charles. And Charles, tell everybody who you are and where you're from. Sure. Charles Seaman, originally from Brooklyn, New York, currently in Charlotte, North Carolina, and an Army Mentor alumni and very proud part of the organization. Awesome. First, I have to ask you, are you a Yankees fan? Mets fan. I have some commonality with Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good. I know, even though the Mets beat us, I still don't hate them. 86 World Series. It's almost sympathetic. It's been that long since they've won, so there's some compassion. That's true. Yeah, we went through that drought. All right, so let's talk about this deal. Tell everybody the size of the deal and how much you paid for it. Just give us a reference of what we're going to talk about today. Sure, absolutely. It's a 236-unit deal in the Atlanta NSA, and the purchase price was $32,300,000. $32,300,000. That's a big raise. First, when I see that number, the first thing I think of is that's a big raise. So there's going to be good lessons on how to raise the amount of money that you needed to do that deal. But let's talk about how you found this deal. Sure. So this one was an on-market deal. It went through a full marketing process, and the process was run by a good broker relationship that I have. Initially, the marketing was done in late December and early January of this year, 2023. And we made it to best and final, which for anybody brand new, best and final is when your offer gets accepted and one of a handful of offers that typically advances to another round. And you try to make the offer sweeter for the seller at that point. So there were five groups that advanced. We had the lowest offer of any of the groups that advanced, but what it really came down to was persistence. Hold on, let, let me stop you right there. So what was the best and final, or I mean, was it an, an open offer, or did they give you a price at the beginning? Good, good um, question. What, what was that beginning price if they did? So it was an open offer to be determined by market. Okay. And initially, they were guiding groups in the upper 34 to low $35 million range. And what was your analysis? What did you come in at? So initially, we came in at $32 million. Oh, okay. And I wasn't really expecting to make it to the best and final round, but I think it's just a sign of where the market is and how the market's softening a bit. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you came in at 32 and how'd you do? So we wound up having the lowest offer of any of the groups in there. Then what happened is initially they awarded it to a different group. They awarded it to the group that was the highest bidder because they were north of a million dollars above. The okay. Lower. And let me stop you there. Did you have the availability to get on a seller's call or a call with the brokers? Yes. Those team calls? Okay. So was the seller on the call? Yes. All right. So describe to everybody, for those that aren't familiar with the seller's calls, what they are and, and what goes on there and if any curves were thrown at you at that time and what the result of that call was. Sure. So for anybody who's never been on one of those, what the seller and the broker are typically doing is they're screening you to make sure you have the capability to close. And a lot of times when you get to a best and final round, they're going to give you a questionnaire and the questionnaire is usually going to ask you about the debt that you plan to use, the equity and the track record that the team has and just some of your underwriting assumptions. So that way they can really make sure that you're a serious buyer and that you have the ability to close. So many times what they do on those interview calls is they take what's in the questionnaire and they basically see how confidently you're answering those questions. So they're asking you about the debt, they're asking you about the equity and they're asking you what your track record is, is one of the big things at any time, but especially now as the market softens, is can a buyer really go out there and close? So the way that you answer those questions sometimes can be what differentiates you from the pack. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So was there any one particular question that you got that you had to answer this question a certain way? So The reason I asked that question is because I lost the deal when sellers didn't always do these seller calls. And then they started doing probably back in late 2008, 2009. And we were on a call and I answered a question wrong and I didn't realize it until after I lost the deal, what that question was. And I'll share that with everybody afterwards. But what did you find? What questions were you given that you knew that you had to answer the right way? The most important one was how do you plan to raise the equity? So with <clears throat> most syndicators, I think sellers are naturally nervous because there's always a, a little bit of doubt. There's something in their head saying, well, can they actually raise the equity? The way I responded, I said, well, listen, this is the biggest deal I've done to date. So I don't want to lie to you and misrepresent you and tell you I've done 10 of these, but 
I said, we have done other deals. And so far, the deals that we've had, we've executed on, we've had success with them. So we don't see any reason why that would be different here. Sometimes there's a little bit of faking it until you make it because it's like, okay, can I really go out there and do this? And you don't know until you do it sometimes, but you have to at least portray that you can. Absolutely. Because you have to portray that you can for sure, because even that's the mindset of somebody that's going to go out and do this. You yeah. have to have that mindset that it's going to get done anyway. So you might as well bring that mindset into the that particular meeting. Right. But I got that question for this deal and we hadn't done a deal. And this is actually around 2010. In 2008, financial crisis happened. Everything was like a big pause and we hadn't done a deal in about a year or so. So the way I answered that question was, they said, how do you plan on raising the funds? And I said, we've got a lot of different investors. We've done a lot of different deals and we got a lot of dry powder. So our investors are just waiting for our next deal. So the raise will be easy. So when we lost the deal, I went back to the broker. I said, why did we lose that deal? I thought we were the best qualified candidate. He said, yeah, but the other company had already shown the deal to their investors and they already had investor buy-in. I was like, oh shit. Ah. You know, I answered that question wrong. So every time I get that question now, I was like, oh, we've already run this deal by our investors. They're excited about this deal and very confident that this trade is going to come quickly. That's how I always answer that question. <laughs> yeah. So you go through the seller. They're like, okay. So they went for the highest bid, which is very common until the highest bid either doesn't qualify, can't get the deal done, or they try to retrade at a very large margin. Yep. How did that buyer lose this deal? Do you know? So what happened is the seller was selling the property we bought and a similar size property right down the block as a portfolio. And this particular buyer had been the highest bidder on both, awarded the entire portfolio. But here's the caveat. They didn't tour the properties prior to submitting an offer. So they went out there, they toured the properties, they thought about it, and they decided to walk away. So that was on both deals. So then we didn't bother bidding on, on the second one because it had way too much delinquency for my liking. And I thought it was just going to be a major challenge with the way the, the eviction courts are in the Atlanta market now. But for the one that we were in the running, the next thing they did was they went back to the second highest bidder. And that bidder was probably about $750,000 higher than we were. That guy had a 1031 exchange, so he couldn't wait around. Once they told him that deal was awarded to somebody else, he went to go find something else. So now his offer was gone because that money was spent. So then there was three offers left. It was two other groups and ours. We had the lowest offer at $32 million, but they were all $300,000 of each other, so not too far apart. And the broker told me transparently, one of the groups, they didn't have any faith at all in the close. And the second group, they said they dealt with them before, but truthfully, they were a major pain in the butt, and they didn't really want to deal with them again. That is a really good point, because I always talk about the three rules of every relationship. Number one, do what you say you're going to do. Number two, make doing business with you easy. And then number three, don't be a pain in the butt. Yeah. Yeah, because there's always another deal waiting behind. And perfect example of this. They didn't mm -hmm. get the deal because they were a pain in the butt. Yeah. So then at that point, the broker called us and said, look, the highest of these groups is at 32300000 Can you get up to that number if you can, the deal's yours? And initially I said, well, we really want to be at 32. But in the big scheme of things, $300,000 most times isn't really going to make a make or break a deal that size. Not too much anyway. You know, if it does, the numbers are probably too tight to begin with. So I said, okay, we can make it work. So it still presented a nice return for the investors. And we said, okay, let's do it. You know, it has a great loan assumption. So it's probably the best thing I've seen in recent months. Okay. So now you've got a big raise. How much was the raise? Total raise was 11.1 million. 11.1. What was the highest raise you had done prior to that? 6 million. Ooh. So you got a double going on here. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about this raise. How did you get that raise done? Well, it was a mix of common equity and preferred equity. So we used $5 million of preferred equity. Who's not sure what that is. Preferred equity is basically it's a higher position on the capital stack. So usually what's happening is the preferred equity partner is taking a lower overall return, but they're doing it for more safety. And that way, if things go terribly wrong, their position and their equity is paid back before the common equity. So we went with $5 million of that. And then the $6 and million. At what rate? So 6% for the current pay, 6% when it was repaid, and then a 10% equity kicker that we had to give them as well. So the preferred equity was 6% plus what? Plus another 6% when it was repaid and 10% of the profit on sale. So essentially, it would have okay. worked out to something like 14.3%. Well, hold on. So compare that to the common. What did the common get? So the common was getting north of 17%. And the returns for the common 
equity actually improved once we brought the PREF equity in, because being that they were taking less, and now we were able to give more to the common equity. So 17 is what we really projected, but it could potentially be as high as like 20% based on, on the returns that we're able to give them now. Okay. So if anybody's confused, I'm just a little bit confused. I understand it, but I'm a little bit confused. So 6% PREF, so they're going to get 6% basically guaranteed, right? It's cumulative. If you don't yeah. hit it, it's cumulative. Okay. Right. And then it's the 6% on the back end. Mm -hmm. And then a 10% of the profits. Right. That calculation there is kind of quirky. You'd have to like get a calculator out to figure out what that might be. Yeah. It worked out to something like 14.3% based on the projected sale price. But yeah, it definitely has a few moving parts in there. Okay. So now you got the common, which you are offering at 17% overall return. Was that uh, annualized or is that IRR? Annualized. Okay, so that's annualized over 17. What did you estimate that their cash on cash was going to be? It was 8% is what we were projecting over the life of the deal. And then, so did you think you're going to hit that first year? So in this case, 8%, no. We were expecting 6% in year one. With stress testing the deal, being the deal had fixed rate debt and a great interest rate, what we figured is if the income stayed exactly the same, if the taxes increased, which we expect they will, and if the insurance increased, which we also expected, then even with those things, we'd still be at a 6% cash on cash return in year one. Okay. Then year two, year three, what's your projections? And then we were projecting north of 8% in year two, north of 9% in year three, and then it just gets sweeter each year that you stay in. Well, pretty good. All right. And that's not cumulative. The risk is not as great there. So excellent. All right. So now you've got your two tiers of investors or you've structured the deal. You've got the two offers that you're bringing out to the marketplace. How did you fill them? Well, it definitely was challenging. For anybody who's been out there raising capital recently, it's certainly been challenging with the market shifting a bit. Initially, we started as a 506B, so that was open to accredited and sophisticated investors. Mm -hmm. And more of our existing network is probably sophisticated, so we wanted to make sure they had a chance to invest. So we ran that for a short period of time. I think we did about three weeks on that. And then we switched over to a 506C, which for me personally is the first time I've done one of those, and, and probably for most of my partners as well. So it was a learning experience. A lot of people think, oh, well, you can market it. It gives you more investors that you can put your deal in front of. And there's truth to that. But the key is you have to know how to market it. Because if you don't, it's going to be quite a learning experience. We, so are you talking about marketing techniques or are you talking about the actual verbiage inside of the ads when you say both, you need to know how to actually. market it? So explain both. Yeah. So the first thing is with the 506C, we were figuring out what the best way to market it was. So with this particular deal, what we did was a whole bevy of Facebook ads. And we hired a marketing consultant who was supposed to have a history of doing similar things with 506C offerings, and he's had good results with them. So at the beginning of the campaign, we expected over a period of two months, it would bring us about 2,000 leads. And of those 2,000 leads, the expectation we had was that 88% of them would probably never answer the phone. So we knew that of the 2,000 leads, there was probably 240 that would really pick the phone up at some point that we'd actually have a chance of working with and engaging. So what happened is we probably got closer to 1,000 leads versus 2,000 over the life of the campaign. So that reduced the overall pool that we were working with. And we did wind up getting it done, but it certainly took a lot more creativity. <laughs> All right. So explain that. Maybe yeah. So what did it take to get it done? What it took to get it done was a lot of teamwork and a lot of the GP team members willing to put more equity in because we realized that the campaign hadn't produced the immediate result we wanted it to. It did bring in a lot of leads and it got at least a couple of that we were able to connect with and engage with. But in actuality, we only converted three of them that really wound up coming in the deal. So by the time we got closer to closing... We had a shortfall on the equity and thankfully our team stepped up and we had the equity to put in, but certainly it took a lot of effort. <laughs> All right. So let's break down the verse. So it's interesting to know that Facebook campaign really didn't work. You, yeah. got, you got three investors out of it, but it didn't really work. Because when I read that in the show notes, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder how they did that. So we could expose it to everybody else. And everybody else could do the same thing, but it was really difficult to make that work. And I know probably why. And it's just because they see you on Facebook, they don't know you, right. you know, it sounds interesting, but then at the same time, like when they get, need to take that next step, like, I don't know this person. 
That's right. why when people are put themselves out there on social media, like on Instagram and TikTok, and they create their own podcast or they go on different podcasts, and when people Google your name, they can see all these different things on there, and then they'll go through them because they will, and then they get to know you. It's not an easier way, but it's through time you build up this like credibility. Right. You know, through time and content, you build up credibility, but it takes time to build it. So that's actually the best way if you're going to use social media is to start now and start building that content out there. And so, that makes a lot of sense because we really figured the campaign would have more long lasting impact because we said it certainly didn't have the immediate pop we wanted. I said, I mean, like I look at it on the flip side, I said, well, if I'm investing passively in somebody's deal. What are the odds that I just find them online, click on an ad, and I'm going to be interested in giving them $100,000? And it's still going to be pretty slim. Now, to your point, you want to know them, you want to feel comfortable with them. So I think that's exactly what happened here. And exactly a lot of the people that clicked on those ads are probably thinking. Let me ask you a question. When they click in and then they get onto your list, okay, did you have autoresponders set up, like an onboarding process set up inside of your CRM? So we did wind up having that, but prior to doing that, we had somebody from the team call and do an individual call with them. And many of them didn't answer. Some of them did. Even the ones that did answer, a lot of them pretty quickly expressed not having any interest and, and not really wanting to find out more. And then you get a smidgen of them that actually had interest and wanted to engage and talk about it. So all of them we did wind up adding to our mailing list so that way they'll receive our, our mailers in the future and be on our drip campaign. I think having that personal connection with them for the ones that did answer probably went a long way. I think as a marketer, I've been in business for many years and I study marketing and this is for everybody else as well. Had you immediately, once they signed up, you sent them an onboarding email that just lists all kinds of credibility. You know what I mean? First, it welcomes them to the community and then it tells you what you're all about. This nice, warm and fuzzy nurturing email. And then below that, it's like, by the way, you want to learn more about us? It's like, Boom! I think who does this best is the guy who does uh, Alex, I forget what his last name is. He teaches YouTube ads, right? And man, that guy, if you just click on one of his YouTube ads and you're interested in it, he follows you everywhere for like two years. You huh. know? He's always popping up. And then when you click on some of his stuff, you see testimonial after testimonial, video after video, podcast after podcast. I mean, it's just overwhelming. So he does a really, really good job at that. But had you done something like that in the meantime, and they could have actually done the studying instead of getting that phone call right away, because it's almost like, ooh, because they know you want something from them. Right. You know, and that something is money. Yeah, so, very true. It, so they're a little bit nervous because before they've got to like and trust you before they're going to do anything with you. Yep. So that being said, in terms of raising the money, so break it down, $11 million, where did it come from? Yeah. So what happened is we wound up getting six million on the common equity side. So what happened is we wound up with probably about four million in there. And then we had to come up with a short fill. Where million. did the four million come from? Was it everybody's list? Did everybody go to their that list? That was everybody's list. list. Yeah. Okay. Good. So that we reached out to existing relationships. The marketing campaign only brought in a small amount, but most was just existing connections and existing relationships that we had. So that, that helped a lot. And then the shortfall we had to come up with from the GP team. So that, that wound up being a lot more costly than we thought, but it got the deal done. And the prep equity actually came through an introduction from a friend of mine that had done a deal with him last year. And he said he had a good experience. So he made an introduction. And then we connected with them probably about a month into the process. They gave us a term sheet. And similar to a lender, prep equity is going to do probably a similar diligence process. They're going to run through a lot of the same things that a lender would. And they're going to make sure that everything meets their criteria. That way they feel comfortable funding it. So is that a private equity company? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Good. All right. So private equity for the PREF, 4 million in common comes from everybody's list. 2 plus million comes from everybody's back pocket. Right. And now I'm in the process of backfilling right now? Yes. Okay. By the way, if anybody wants to get on Charles's list, you can see that QR code up in the upper right-hand corner. That's what I was clicking on earlier to see what it said. You can get on his list that way if you're interested in talking to him about this deal. So, okay. So that was the raise. All right. So now let's go into the property inspection. So who did it and what turned out? Yes. We had a third-party management company do the inspection and they did both the physical and the financial due diligence. So with the physical, we did over a three-day span in late February. And during that time, they had somewhere between 30 and 40 vendors out there. They had three foundation guys. They had 30 to 40 vendors out there? Yeah. Wow. 
they did a pretty thorough inspection. You know, two of the foundation guys that came out really went through everything and they crawled through every crawl space at the property, which was great. Thankfully, the inspection went pretty smooth and we found that there was some more foundation work needed than we had anticipated. But overall, our CapEx budget was good. It just wound up being reallocated. And the financial due diligence didn't turn up any red flags, so that was good. You know, the lease would have checked out pretty close to what they had on the rent roll. And the biggest red flag, but I'm not terribly surprised because we kind of knew the seller wasn't an operator and that wasn't his strong point, is that he was letting in a lot of tenants that didn't have great credit scores. There's a lot of people with 500 and 550 credit scores. So that's really where the value is going to be you know, in year one and year two is cleaning out some of those tenants and replacing them as we start seeing leases expire. Mm -hmm. Was it 232 units? 236, yep. 236 units. How many of them were two months or more behind on their rent? Thankfully, less than 10. Oh, that's pretty good. One thing the seller did really good at, even though they did let a lot of people with undesirable credit scores in, they charged them hefty fees to move in there. So they charged what's called a risk fee, which I never quite seen anybody do before, but it seemed to screen out anybody who didn't want to pay it, I guess. So that was good. So it was called a risk fee? Right. And the risk fee was not refundable. So it wasn't like a security deposit, but basically for anybody who had undesirable credit, they charged them that on the front end. So I guess that motivated them to pay because they were losing that money one way or the other. How much? How much was Uh, that fee? It depends on how bad the credit was, but in most cases, it varied between $500 and $1,000. And for a lot of these tenants that are workforce housing tenants, that's a good chunk of change. So Yeah. And they don't get that back? No. That's interesting. It was. I never heard that fee before. It was kind of brilliant. (laughs) Yeah. They must really want to move into that place to be paying that fee. Yeah. Okay. So foundation work, that was the only thing that was brought up during the inspection that was the red flag? Yes. I mean, there was other items, but nothing that was like out of the ordinary. So, I mean, the seller had reshingled all the roofs throughout the property over the life of his ownership. We determined that even though the shingles were there, we weren't happy with some of the boot work and the socket work, but but all pretty standard things. So nothing really out of the ordinary beyond the foundation work. Okay. What's the value add here? How are you going to increase these values? If there wasn't much deferred maintenance or a lot of going on, what's so the big value is really operational. So this particular seller, what his strong point is, is going in there, buying a property at a discount, executing a heavy CapEx plan, and then unloading it. And that, that's basically what he did here. So he bought this property in 2020 for $14.5 million. He put $3.3 million in CapEx into it over three years. So overall, he's all in for seventeen eight, And then at that point, he just stabilizes the property and he unloads it. So he's not in the business of staying in there and operating it for the long term because that's not his forte. So where the value it here is, is really on the lease expiration is being able to push rents. So the mm-hmm. average rent of the property now is 1133. And based on comps in the area, what other comps are actually getting right now, what we see is that a lot of the comps are supporting an average rent of 1420. We projected 1356 over two years. So being that a lot of the heavy lifting is done, it's really just cycling tenants through as the leases expire and then being able to push the rents effectively. What are you going to do to the units? Is there any upgrading to the units that are needed? Not much. He he actually upgraded 229 of them and he did a pretty nice job. 1971 property. I mean, he he put some good money into them. So you can see aesthetically, they look good. I think there's always going to be problems with the 70s property. You're always going to have some things that go wrong, obviously, on the maintenance side. So we'll have to address those. But We'll upgrade the remaining seven units and then any other beautification work would really be in the common area. One thing we found in recent years, I think you would actually mention this many times through the years, was signage and landscaping go a long way. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of truth to it because you can have the most beautiful apartment in the world, but if people aren't motivated to walk inside it, they'll never know that. So the thought here is if we beautify the, the landscape and spruce the property up, that's something we can certainly use to attract more prospective tenants and a more desirable tenant base. Absolutely. So I was on a call the other day and one of the foundations I support is an organization called Abington Copes, which is a drug prevention. It's drug prevention for youth. It's drug support for people that are using, that are looking to get out of using. It's support for people that are not using anymore and looking to live a productive life. 
So we support that community and we support that at Ultimate Partnering, by the way. If anybody's interested in ultimatepartnering.com, that's our big event that's going to be happening in San Diego coming up. Huge. You can learn about it there. But on that, so what we're doing is we're expanding now. So now we're able to give support. We're able to give Narcon. We're able to educate the youth through other vendors coming in and even start doing drugs. But so our next step is to actually get a home for women that are recovering. So it's a, the next step back into society. So like I've done in every, all my businesses, I've gotten somebody that has been successful in the business and then asked them how to do it. I didn't know him. He didn't know me. So he was explaining that business to me as if I knew nothing about real estate investing, which is that's the way I wanted it. And he said to me, he made this statement. I said, so I said, Ryan, so what am I missing? So we went through all the possible ways of income. We went through all of the different expenses. I said, but what else do I have to factor in to determine where I need to be to make this house profitable? And even though it's a nonprofit, you still need to be profitable. Do you know what I mean? To keep it running. Yep. He said, every month, no matter what, there's going to be a surprise. There's going to be some sort of a maintenance surprise that you're going to be hit with. And it's going to be between $400 and $600. You don't know what it is at the beginning of the month, but by the end of the month, you know what it is. And when he's saying that, I'm thinking about all the properties I've owned through the years, right? Especially those 70s properties. Yep. And it's like, there's always a big surprise. During the year, there's always a big surprise. And each month, there's like these surprises that come on on a regular basis. Right. So when you said that, 70s properties, and there's going to be a surprise, it's like, yeah. And knowing that and factoring it in, you're prepared for the surprise. You don't know what it is, but it's going to come. Right. Absolutely. And most times it usually winds up being a plumbing issue and and occasionally an electrical one, I find. (laughs) Yeah. We've even had them. So one of our properties, the 70s properties, the wires across the streets were too low from property to property. A high truck came by and ripped down the wires. Oh, jeez. Then we had to... (laughs) And then what that caused was, of course, some units lost electrician right out there, but the city got involved. And then the city required upgrades on the two buildings that were affected. And that was like, oh, shit, you know, that's like 10, 15,000 each. And it's still like, you remember Gomer Pyle from... uh, Yep. Surprise, surprise, (laughs) surprise. (laughs) All right. So there's one more note that I wanted to get, and I have it down here. What was it? It was about... Oh, acquisition fee. What's the acquisition fee in this deal? So on this one, it was 3% of the purchase price, so 969000 969000 Woo! That's awesome. General partners split that. And then you describe what the investors were getting, but what are the general partners getting? What did you project in terms yeah, so, of, not percentage, but give it to me in terms of profits? What yeah, are you going to share? Absolutely. So for the general partners, what we were projecting, so, I mean, the acquisition fee, obviously, on the front side. Yep. Then on the back side, there's a disposition fee, and that's 425000 That, again, is projected, so it obviously will fluctuate depending on where the sale price is. And that's, is that 1% resale price? Yep. So you're projecting you're going to resell it for $42 million. Right. So then of the equity that's created, what percentage are you keeping? So that we're doing a 70-30 split. Okay. And we have a hurdle, a 16% IRR, where if the investors achieve that, then anything above that amount gets split 50-50. So... For the full GP team, we're expecting somewhere around $2.1 million for the equity on the sale, and then mm-hmm. that will be split amongst the different partners. All right. So we've got a million in acquisition fee. We got a couple of million coming out of the deal, plus a $425,000 disposition fee. What about the cash flow? The cash flow, we're not really seeing a ton on the GP side. There, there'll probably be a very minimal amount. Yeah. The line share is really going to go to the LPs throughout the life of the deal. And then for the asset management fee, we're using... Lighthouse Management Solutions, we met through you guys. They'll be collecting that and supervising the, the management company. By the way, so that was a referral that we don't do that. Okay. Uh, just if anybody's listening. Sorry about that. We referred to somebody. We gave you a referral to another team. So you get the asset management fee per month. And are you splitting that or is that going towards, I know a lot of people use asset management fees in order to run their companies for payroll. What are you guys using for yours? Are you splitting it? So... For payroll, what we typically do is we usually divide up the acquisition fees and just budget those out. But that's probably something good to think about going forward. Yeah, I've seen that model and it, and it works. Works pretty good. All right. So now I want to ask you as we conclude this, this that, there's a lot of good learning lessons in that deal. When I saw this one come across my desk, I was like, oh, wow, this is a good deal to talk about. So congratulations on the deal. Let me ask you about what is in terms of books that you read. What is your favorite business book that you've read through the years? And what are you reading now, if anything? So my favorite one's probably Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, yeah. probably a classic one that everybody picks. I've always found that one very inspirational. It's very common sense, I would say, a lot of things, but it's not common sense if you're not exposed to that. Mm-hmm. So for me growing up, I was raised by a single mother and I never really was around passive income. So the first time I ever was exposed to that was at the age of 19 in network marketing. 
And then after that, when I started getting in personal finance, which that point that certainly opened my eyes and mind to a lot of things I wasn't really thinking about at the time because I didn't know about them. So that one probably had a big influence on me, I would say, personally. What about now? What are you reading? Right now, I'm not reading any books currently. I probably do a lot more articles and blogs nowadays. I need to start reading books again. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of good ones out there. You know what, there I found? If it's a business book, I will read it page by page because I like to take notes. Yeah. I like to be able to go back and I've got huge bookshelves in my house. They're everywhere. And I've got this section of my favorites. I always pull out the favorites and I read once in a while. I read all the highlights in there. But on the other type of books, I listen to audiobooks on a regular basis and I get so much information packed in there. It's, uh, it's really, really good. When you talk about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the very first Rich Dad, Poor Dad book I read was Retire Young, Retire Rich. And I thought, okay. that's what I want. I didn't know anything about Rich Dad, Poor Dad back at the time, way back then. But I read that book and I was like, that's ah, good stuff. That was one of the books that started my journey into entrepreneurship. So Charles, that was great. So for everybody else, this is Multifamily Deal Lab. This is the deal that we just dissected with Charles. If you want to get a hold of him, you can do the QR code or Charles... If somebody can't do that QR code, how else can they get a hold of you? Sure. Best thing they can do is just shoot me an email. And that's charles at cashflowchamps.com. Awesome. And that concludes this edition of Multifamily Deal Lab. This has been another edition of Multifamily Deal Lab. If watching on YouTube, please be sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, so you don't miss the next session. And review the contact links on this page. 